Give them all a round of applause. They did wonderful. And one of the, the reasons why this last song that we did, because we often sing all these songs about everyone. We sing about Mary. We sing about the angels. But many of us, we forget about the three kings. We forget about the wise men or the magi as is written. We forget at how their story and what their travel really meant. And I believe that God just wants us to spend some time um, learning a little bit more about what their travel, what their voyage teaches us. So I'm asking you, if you don't mind, could you stand with me? I'm going to turn your Bibles to the book of Matthew chapter 2. And the title for today is Wise Men Will Always Seek Him. Wise men still seek him. So Matthew chapter 2. And if you can, just stand as we read God's word. And it reads as follows. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of King Herod, there were wise men from the east that arrived unexpectedly in Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who had been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east, and that we have come to worship him. And when King Herod heard this, he was deeply disturbed. And I want you to understand, not everyone is happy when you go to worship the Lord. Not everyone is excited when you are ready to pray. Not everyone wants to hear about this person, Jesus. When King Herod heard this, he was deeply disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. So he assembled all of the chief priests and scribes of the people and asked them, where is the Messiah to be born? They responded in Bethlehem of Judea, they told him. Because this is what was written by the prophet. And it says, And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the leaders of Judah. Because out of you will come a leader who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly summoned the wise men and asked them, the exact time the star appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. And when you find him, report back to me so that I too can go and worship him. After hearing the king, they went on their way. And there it was, the star they had seen in the east. It led them until it came and stopped above the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed beyond measure. And entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and falling to their knees, they worshiped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Verse 12, and being warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their own country by another route. Wise men still seek him. Wise men still seek after the things of the Lord. Wise men and women and sons and daughters Still look for the presence of a Savior. Wise people still walk into the house of God expecting that they will have an encounter with Jesus. Father, we pray, God, and we give you thanks on this day, this day that we celebrate your birth and your arrival. God, that arrival meant something tremendous for the people then. But it also means something incredible for us today. And Lord Father God, just as wise men traveled far from the east to catch a glimpse of your glory, 
I pray, God, that we today will also journey and get uncomfortable as we seek you out as well. Father, we ask that these words will be applied to our hearts. In Jesus' name we say, amen. Amen. You may be seated. And these wise men were anxious to see Christ. And the scripture and history tells that they traveled far from the east. And uh, the east of Bethlehem uh, was understood to be maybe part of the Orient. And they weren't necessarily God's chosen people. And as I'm reading this text and as I was studying, I was, I'm a little bit puzzled why, well, Warren, why were they called wise? And, and the scripture says, anyone that desires wisdom desires a, a good thing. And, and I've always used this terminology that you can be smart but dumb at the same time. Now, how many of you know somebody that falls into that category? They have book knowledge. They know vocabulary. They can pass any test. But when it comes to wisdom, when it comes to the application of knowledge, they seem to be lacking. And God doesn't want us simply to have knowledge and to be smart, but God wants us to be wise. So knowledge is the accumulation of information, but wisdom is the ability to apply that information. Does everyone get that? See, you may read scripture and you may memorize scripture, which you have knowledge, but until you're able to apply it to situations, then you're lacking wisdom. And so oftentimes we pray with knowledge, but without wisdom. We take applications or we take jobs and we do things with knowledge, but God wants us to move with wisdom. I will tell you today that wise men will always seek a savior. Wise men, those that consider themselves to be wise, will always seek his presence. And in these few sections, I'm going to just share very briefly with you this morning on what wise men should always do. I'm no longer talking about the three or more from the east. I know we always say that there were three wise men. The Bible doesn't necessarily say that there were three, that they would say that there were wise men from the east. We associate the number three because there were three gifts presented. So we make that assumption that there were only three wise men. But they traveled from a long distance to see Christ. They were so anxious to see him that they wasn't concerned about their own ambitions, their own desires. They didn't care how far. They were hungry. They were, they, were, they, they were following a star. A star is simply a promise. A star in the story is simply a, a prophecy of what is to come. They were willing to follow a star before they even saw Jesus. And here we are. We have many of us. We've been touched and we've been intimately introduced to Jesus. And sometimes we fail to follow him wherever he leads. But wise men will always seek the Savior. In the book of Isaiah 43, verse 11, it says, I even, I am the Lord, and there is no Savior beside me. Can I tell you, is that there is no other God but our God. There is a prophet that they call Muhammad, but he is not a God. There is Confucius, which uh, um, they, they, some may worship, but he is not God. We serve one who is only the risen Savior, and that is Jesus Christ the Lord. I, I believe wise men seek the Savior, and I want to use the, the, the word seek. It, it really is it, more than just a casual searching. There's been some times where we've been in the mall, and this more so, yeah, I think, for some reason, it happens to mothers more than it happens to fathers, is that their children sometimes hide in the mall or hide in the store. And I don't know if you've ever had an experience where your child is missing and you start looking to see where your child is. Has anyone ever searched for a loved one before and you left them here, you go back, they're not there. 
that initial reaction is that you do a casual search. Well, Caleb. A casual. You, you, you don't want to draw attention to yourself. So you casually search and seek. And after 30 seconds changes it to a minute. And after a minute changes into a couple of minutes. That whisper all of a sudden becomes a lot louder. Caleb. Where are you, Caleb? Still not trying to draw too much attention to yourself because you don't want people to think that you're an unfit parent, that you've lost your child at Disney World. So no. But you're seeking. You, you get to the point where you realize that a casual looking is not enough. That all of a sudden your tension starts to get a little bit uneasy. You start to pray in the spirit and, and all of a sudden, Caleb! Where are you? You start to ask people, have you seen a boy? Have you seen someone about this high? Have you seen him? And, and all the while, he may be laughing behind the clothes rack as you're searching. But the process of seeking is not passive. It's not about convenience, about desperation. And so wise men will always be desperate with seeking the presence of the Lord. We won't be casual about finding Jesus, finding him in our situation, in our lack. We'll, we'll get to the point where a whisper sometimes is not enough. I, I know we can sometimes say, God, I need you, and that sounds good. But there are times you're going to have to go to your knees and say, God, I need you. And we sing this song, I need thee, oh. I need thee every hour. I need thee. Yet these wise men, these magi, they traveled and they traveled with desperation, not knowing exactly where that they were going, but they understood that there's something that changed in the atmosphere. You have to understand when things are changing. You have to be spiritually aware. See, they were searching for something. They saw a star appear. All of a sudden, they oh, okay, this is not a regular star. This is not a regular situation. I need to be able to discover what the meaning of this is. So they left their car comfort zone to find a star. And the next slide said, wise men will travel out of their comfort zone. If I asked you the question, would you consider yourself wise, you may think that that has to do with age initially. But raise your hand if you believe that you are wise. I'm not going to put you on the spot. I'm not going to ask you any questions. But wise. That you operate with wisdom. That you don't make decisions purely based upon emotion. Should we not seek for wisdom? Did not Solomon ask for wisdom above wealth, above fame? Yet we saw that wisdom was an introduction to those other things. And I believe that if we can be wise, if we can seek him, which is why the scripture says, seek ye first to what? The kingdom of God, be desperate after the things and everything else can be added to you. And when you're seeking the kingdom of God, what you're seeking for is wisdom. Because I understand that there are two kingdoms. There is the earthly kingdom and there's a heavenly kingdom. But I'm not looking to build a castle on this planet. I'm looking to have a mansion built by God himself. So wise men will always... Be willing to travel outside of their comfort zone. When's the last time you've been stretched? Uncomfortable. I wonder sometimes if the chairs in these church have too much cushion. That maybe, uh, and I've heard the story that some of you, um, some of us, and I can't say us because that was never my experience, but I heard that for some that when you grew up and maybe where um, you first went to church, all they had was wooden benches can't sleep on wooden benches. 
And we've upgraded, and now we're sitting on cushy chairs. In fact, we have carpet on the ground, so if you fall out and roll over, you're okay. Your white dress will still be white. But some of you remember those days and those times where there was no carpet. Not even necessarily concrete, but just dirt. So you know that if you were on the ground and you were wearing something white, that had to be the Lord, first of all, because if it was you, you were like, oh. <laughs> but I believe that we, when we allow God to take us out of our places of comfort, that is when we'll start to see a place of glory. Wise men and women will be open to be placed outside of their comfort zone. We'll move into areas of ministry which is not easy. Because if it's easy for you, then it's you that gets the glory. But when it's hard for you, then you understand that his strength is made perfect in your weakness. And when you're facing difficulty and it's hard for you and when you overcome, you can't say it's because of me. All you have to do is say, God, if it wasn't for you on my side, I don't know where I would have been. So wise men like the Magi will travel outside of their comfort zone that they will go wherever they have to. They'll do whatever is necessary. If they pray for an hour and they don't see a breakthrough, then they'll say, I'm going to pray for two. If they pray for two hours and they don't see a shifting, they say, I'm going to pray for three. If they see three hours didn't happen, they're going to call in and say, I can't come into work tomorrow. There's something that I need from the Lord. I need to move outside of this time, place of being comfortable to achieve and receive which God has to for me, wise men will always be willing to step out of their comfort zone. And some of you, that has happened for you this year. And, and there's, two, there's two ways you can either make the decision to do it or that decision is made for you. Has anyone been pushed into a blessing? Has anyone been pushed... You, you didn't want to do it. You didn't want to go. But, but God said, you know what? Enough is enough. There's something that I have for you, and I need you to get uncomfortable because where you are on your job, where you are in certain relationships, where you are even in my, the relationship with God is just not enough. I want you to be uncomfortable. I'm going to wake you up in the middle of the night because you, you, you're not really seeking me the way how I used to. I'm going to allow trouble to trouble you to get you on your knees because you've gotten to comfortable. You're sitting back in your easy chair when I want you to get to do the work of God. I'm going to push you into what I want you to do for me. So I wish I could say that it will always be a choice, but there's some times where God says enough is enough. If you won't do it, I'm going to push you to it because that's the God that we serve, loves us enough to push us towards our destiny. James 1 verse 22 says, But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. If God says walk in the spirit, then that means movement. Don't just quote scripture. It's time we start living scripture. If you're not moving, if you're at the same place you were a year ago, then God says that you're not, you're not uncomfortable enough. Because the moment that I start to rock the, you know what happens to a baby eagle? How does a baby eagle learn how to fly? All right. the, the, the mama eagle, you know, sees the baby eagle and, and, and starts to, to, to push the nest. All right. All right, wants to get the baby eagle uncomfortable because the baby eagle feels fine. They're in the nest. Their mama's feeding them, but the mama eagle said, you know what? If you stay here, you're never going to be able to fly. So the, so the mama eagle starts to just push the, the nest and starts to get the baby eagle uncomfortable. And after a while, you know, there are times where, where literally pushes the baby eagle out. And the baby eagle, once it's falling, all of a sudden instinct starts to happen, starts to flap its wings. That which she didn't, didn't think she was able to do before, all of a sudden she's able to do. Because she was taken out of the comfort zone. 
The next one is that wise men will seek to please the king or the king over any other king. The scripture described that the wise men came and they announced that we're here to see the king, a baby that is born. They didn't say, I'm here to see Herod. They didn't say that I'm here to get a promotion. They didn't say that I want to go to the White House and go to the Oval Room. They say, no, I'm here to see the king. Now, interestingly, King Herod, instead of celebrating, and I guess that is understood, he thought that Jesus was a threat to his earthly kingdom. Jesus did not come to take a throne on the earth. Jesus' throne is in heaven, and no man can stand against that. The wise men will seek to please the king over any other king. In Acts 5, verse 28, it says, We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name. This was the religious people were talking to Peter and the others. And he said, Yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us responsible for this man's blood. But Peter and the other apostles replied, We must obey God rather than men. I, I must do what God says rather than what men want. I, I must serve serve my king and not just the kings of this world. I, I must go to bed at night believing that I live my life in such a way that Jesus is pleased with me. I'm here to serve the king and not just any old king. Who's with me if that's you this morning? The next one is that wise men will be led by the Spirit and not by their own understanding. Romans 8 verse 14 says, For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Galatians 5 verse 18 says, But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Galatians 5 verse 25 says, If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Proverbs 3 verse 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not unto your own understanding. When the wise men arrived and the King Herod heard what the, the reason why they came, the king called them and said, you know what, come and talk to me a little bit. Tell me a little bit more about this king you came to worship. Very underhanded. Very sneaky. There are some sneaky people that are going to be approaching you. Going to try to get information about your family, your friends, your church. They don't mean you any good. But they only mean for you what? Evil. We've got to know or be sensitive to the people that cross our paths. I, I believe that these wise men, that they, they knew a little bit about hearing from God because before they went back, even though they had said, yes, we'll come back and tell you where the Messiah is in a dream, God spoke with them and they responded. I know God speaks through dreams. God talks to us oftentimes in the middle of the night. I, I don't want you to be casual about the visions and the dreams that God is releasing to you while you're sleeping. And why is it that he gives you these dreams oftentimes while we're asleep? It's because it's at that time our mind and our body is at rest. And it's at that moment where you are most vulnerable for spiritual attack, but it's also the place where I believe that God can get to you in the most profound ways while you're asleep. Because while you're awake, your mind is on everything else. You know, at a certain time in the morning, you're thinking about what you're going to eat for lunch. You know, at lunchtime, even before you finish lunch, you may be thinking about what you're going to eat for dinner. 
You're thinking about what you're going to wear the next day or what's gonna, uh, uh, what, what, what type, size shoe you, or what type of shoe you're going to get uh, when you go to the mall. You th- your mind is constantly plagued while you are awake. But the moment that you are sleeping, I believe God is able to get our attention and speak some things into our heart that we'll never be able to understand while we are awake. This last one is that wise men will bring gifts and worship. First Chronicles 16 verse 23 says, I want you just to get ready to worship with me. But it says, sing to the Lord all the earth. Proclaim his salvation day after day. Verse 24, declare his glory among the nations. His marvelous deeds among all peoples. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the nations are idols. But the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and joy are in his dwelling place. Ascribe to the Lord all you families of nations. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Wise men will always come with worship. Always come bearing gifts. They travel distances and miles. And the very moment that they arrived at where Jesus was lying in a manger, before they even entered the home where he was, they were so excited. I, I believe that they were getting themselves ready and they were pulling out these gifts and they said, I can't wait to worship Jesus. I can't wait to get into his presence. I can't wait to tell him how glad that I'm here. A wise man will always bring gifts and worship. And First Chronicles 16 goes on to say, verse 29, Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. The world is firmly established. It cannot be moved. Let the heavens rejoice. Let the earth be glad. Let them say among the nations that the Lord reigns. Wise men, wise women, wise sons and daughters will always seek the king. They'll always seek an audience with the king. They won't be self-serving, but they'll be humble. I mean, these men were intellectuals. They were brilliant. Any degree that was possible then, they probably had it. But they understood that all of man's knowledge is nothing compared to being in the presence of a baby. Do you understand the profound, almost opposite end of the spectrum? We have these older men that were learned and brilliant and wise according to man's standard, but they understood the scripture calls them wise not because of what they had here, but because they sought and seek Jesus. As for me, mama didn't raise a fool. My mama taught me how to seek Jesus. My parents modeled the way. They they taught me how to pray earnestly. Seeking day and night. 
I'm not looking at fools in the audience. I'm looking at people that I believe that God is called to be wise. That you'll be willing to seek to please our king versus the world system. That you'll be led by the spirits and not by your own what? Understanding. That you will be doers of the word. Not hearers only. That you'll be willing to travel outside of your comfort zone to accomplish what God has for you. The wise men will always bring worship. And if you consider yourself wise this morning, and I invite you to bring your gift of worship even now. So with every eye closed and with your hearts bent, Imagine that you are with the company of the Magi that traveled. That after traveling weeks and months, you arrived at a place where your Savior was. And that you had an opportunity to kneel at his feet. And to present gifts. For them it was gold, frankincense, and myrrh. For us, it's our worship in heart, in giving, and in love. As we sing, bow down and worship. you to make another physical position change. There may some of you that you may want to come and kneel at this altar. There may be some that say, I want to kneel at this chair. But I want you to take this moment to bring the gift of worship to a Savior who came as a gift of salvation so that you can be saved and have eternal life. I understand that Christmas is about giving gifts to one another, and that's wonderful, but the greatest gift that we can give to our Savior is first our heart, but second is our worship. And if he already has your heart, then what it desires is your worship that's true, it's unbothered. It takes you out of your comfort zone. 
that demonstrates that you're seeking him, searching for him. God, I need to find you in my situation. I need to find you. I need to find deeper depths. So is there anyone that's willing to be uncomfortable? Spend a few moments on your knees and to worship him. Move from your position. You're sitting down. And just kneel on your chair or join at the altar. Father, we thank you.